I have to admit, when I first heard of Bait, it was not just announced as famous film critic Mark Kermode's favourite film of 2019, but his favourite film of the entire decade, the 2010s. I thought, how could this be? This film is just... It's almost like it must be pandering so much to uh, someone like Kermode's tastes that, and it's so fine-tuned that I'm going to see the film and it's going to be entirely predictable, like one of those contemporary, you know, stabs at a folk horror adventure. Uh, you know, bring it on, Bait. Now listen, I don't know if Bait is the finest film of the 2010s, although it's very close to being the most impressive and striking British UK release of the 2010s for me. It's going to draw inevitable comparisons to the American picture The Lighthouse by Robert Eggers and I think there's this shared kinship in their aesthetic emphasis on what we would perhaps recognise those of us who know a little something of film history, we would recognise it as though it's an aesthetic born of initially technological limitations from the 1930s wherein frames had a certain specificity, a certain bordered quality about them. And one common topic for films at this time was the exciting prospect of depicting seafaring nautical naval, whether it be for educational purposes, purposes of escapist adventure, or for highlighting some sort of uh, military hurrah. I think of a couple of John Ford films from around this time, like Submarine Patrol and um, uh, Seas Beneath from 31, for example, in the mainstream Hollywood context. But I know the, the French films, which I'm probably less familiar with around that time, the nautical films, were what influenced Eggers, from what I understand, on The Lighthouse. Whereas Bait has there's also these similarities of early there's documentary shot on lesser film stock for television slice of life reality kitchen sink realism bait as one of the most fascinating structures and aesthetic ethoses of, of any film from the 2010s and though it is trying to be something traditional in a basic storytelling sense Oh, in a it is has residue of older genre archetypes. Yet its use of the technology not the technology itself is is it's an old Bolex camera hand rolled Bolex camera that Jenkins is using shooting the film with. But there's its utilization of edits is entirely contemporary. Its philosophy of post-production is... It's a very digital philosophy, despite his usage of analogue celluloid. I don't think it's celluloid specifically. But whatever the Pollux camera's using. In any case, but there's also... In, in, in bait... Uh, it's so contemporary in its thematic, its political pathos is extremely modern and even though it was a 2019 release, had it been a 2023 release, it would still be considered very, very modern. It, it has had a staying power since 2019. But is actually possibly an indictment of a lack of progress, a certain stagnation the world has undergone like to read out some quotes that I've mined from interviews with Jenkins. I've linked the interviews in the description of this video, but I'm going to read out what I felt were some choice passages here and now. The original premise was that it was a found footage film about this fisherman who'd had an affair for a rich holiday maker. He'd been attracted to this glamorous woman coming down and she was attracted to the rugged fisherman, but had a fling and she'd gone back up the country and he got on with his life. And then he found out that she was pregnant he had written himself out of their life, but he decided to pick up a camera and start making a video diary of his life. So when this kid is old enough, he can learn who his dad is. And as he started filming his way of life, he realized it isn't what he thought it was. He wasn't living in a fishing place anymore. He was living in a holiday destination. And the camera also became a catalyst for the simmering resentment underneath the surface. 
So people wanted to say things to him on camera and the camera behind became this thing that kind of blew the place up. That's what I find is missing in a lot of the stuff that I watch. That spirituality. It's not a religious thing, but some kind of otherness within it. That's really important to me. I read Paul Schrader's book and I didn't understand what he was getting at to a certain extent, but I kind of like the fact that it's very difficult to quantify what it is. A sense of otherness is very important, and I think sometimes when people try to tell me how they feel about the film and the way the form and the subject matter combine, I do think that's what they're trying to get at. There's something intangible, and I think that's what film can do that no other art form does, but it's really untapped, that kind of otherness. I do most of the foley myself in the studio, which is a wet space where I do all the processing, and when the film is sent off to be scanned, I repurpose the space to become somewhere I'm working in the dry. I built a voiceover booth out of wreck wood on the beach and stuff, so it's a real proper salty space, and then I get the actors in one by one. This time I got Edward Rowe in first to spend four or five days voicing his stuff and getting him in set, the rhythm for everyone else, because he's the one in almost every scene and being proactive. Then I get the actors in one at a time, gradually building up the layers of voicing. Because of the way I shoot with a lot of big close-ups, faces have got to be spot on. So a lot of it is looking at people's eyes and thinking, put a light there and you're really going to jump off the screen. A lot of people have met people who have been in the film and not recognised them because they look so different on screen. Black and white is a level of abstraction, of course, but just the way those lenses change the shape of people's faces and give significance to the eyes and all of that in a way that our eyes don't do. I retraced my steps to where I first fell in love with making films, and it was when I was a teenager with a Super 8 camera, and I'd save up to buy a single roll of film. I would be really careful about what I would film. I would look at things through the viewfinder, but I wouldn't film things until I was absolutely sure. That was around the point when someone had decided that film was dead forever and the industry had moved on. It paradoxically became very easy to find out how to work with film in a homemade sense, because the knowledge didn't have a financial value anymore, so that the secret could be given away. I'd always hand-processed photographs before. How, how difficult could it be to hand-process my own 8mm and 16mm film? I realised how achievable it is and how rewarding it is to be involved with the alchemy of creating images in front of your very eyes. What I wasn't expecting was how much it was going to influence the way that I was making stuff. What I was really in need of wasn't the tactility or the aesthetic, but it was actually the limitations that film ensured that I worked within. If I had shot the same way on film as digitally, I'd have been bankrupt in five minutes, so it was a practical manifesto rather than a political or artistic one. I shoot with a manual clockwork Bolex 16mm camera and have to physically hold the shutter down. I've got two choices for what I can do with the other hand. I can have a pan or tilt the camera, or I can focus pull. So this aesthetic was born out of what I could do with that camera and its limitations. A lot of the close-up work is something I always do because I don't shoot any coverage. I always shoot feet to cover myself for transitions, but you can also tell a lot about the characters by looking at what shoes they're wearing and what their feet are doing. You've got this dark contrast between leisure and industry that runs through the film. Delicate shoes or trainers are always up against working boots. Hands as well. The working hand, the blue collar and the white collar hand, effectively. You can say so much more with an image rather than any exposition or dialogue. Whether I'm reverse engineering meaning into those shots, or whether that was always there and I just wasn't conscious of it, it's still really important to me. The other day somebody said to me, when it comes down to it at the end of the day, it's got to be about story, which I do agree with, but I think when people hear that, a lot of the time they also say that the film is really about the script. I couldn't disagree more with that sentiment. We have so many decisions that are made at script level, so many conversations about script development. After that, you can have a 10 minute conversation before you're about to shoot about what it's going to look and sound like. We're working in an art form that is 120 years old, and we already seem to have given up on the discussion of what the form should be. It's kind of desperate, and I think it's really bad in this country. The conversation about form in Britain is pushed to the margins. It's pushed out to where people are working in so-called experimental film. Certainly a lot of my short film work gets put into that experimental category. I don't really know anybody who works in experimental film who would describe themselves as experimental filmmakers. They're just filmmakers who feel the need, or even maybe a responsibility, if that doesn't sound too grandiose, to be experimenting with this very youthful form. What I've really seen is, it might be a change within me, thinking that I'm making films that are concerned with a local issue where I live and in a place that I understand, to now being something that seems to be certainly national in this country, but also quite internationally relevant. That gap between the haves and the have-nots, as they say, 
I heard someone recently say the haves and the have yachts, which I thought was a nice expression as well. But that's sort of the main argument that is linked to everything in this moment, certainly in this country. It's something I really empathize with, and I'd absolutely agree that the gap between the haves and the have and the have nots is getting bigger and bigger. But also if you do keep talking about it in those simple terms, you're not really going to get anywhere. I don't go into anything until I've got a huge list of limitations to work within. Because where I shape all of the work is within what I'm not able to do. Working at small budgets helps because you've got a huge limitation straight away, so you have to start working in different ways. Not everybody has that luxury of a low budget, which is why some people make such terrible films. We create a language and a way of working around what we're able to do. There were angles we couldn't shoot, which is great because you think we can only shoot in this direction, so you can throw away the idea of doing any establishing shots after that, so it becomes a film of close-ups, which is a prominent aesthetic within the film. I love the power of the montage, and I love the fact that the one unique property of film as an art form is the close-up, so it's crazy not to use it. Bresson is never far from my thinking. I'm from the Scorsese school of if you're stuck, ask yourself what Bresson would do because he would always choose the most simple thing. And I think that when I'm writing, I write visually. I write a scene and imagine it as five shots, but can I do it in four, three? I'm always simplifying, and that's where Bresson is with me. But the kind of montage was that I like to work with is probably something that he would have disapproved of quite vehemently because it's too impressionistic for his Catholic tastes. People told me I'm making horror films without any horror in. You know The Shout, 1978, the British horror film of John Hurt? That's my thing, using the form, not invisibly but making something where the horror exists in the edits as much as the content of the shots. I don't see all films set in Cornwall as Cornish cinema. That's not to say it has to be made in Cornwall by Cornish people to be a Cornish film, but I think a lot of films in the past set in Cornwall are about somebody coming into Cornwall in crisis, which is crystallised by being in a rural place full of real people who are archetypal at best, mostly stereotypes. And they will, through the sum of their parts, make this newcomer see the error of their ways. They'll adjust their worldview and head home. That can be done brilliantly, like in Local Hero 1983, but a lot, of, a lot of films outside of the urban setting use their rural settings for background colour, and what I'm interested in is bringing that to the foreground because it's been seen less. It's one of the only things that I can, things I can write about because it's what I know, but I think if you can create those authentic, complex, flawed people, I think that's the Cornish cinema I want to see, and any kind of regional or national cinema that brings out the reality. The more specific you get with something, the more universal it becomes. A Bayesian woman, whose dad was a fisherman, came up to me after a screening in Berlin and she said that was his life. The other side of the ocean, nothing I know about, but it's the issues people face. I started 20 years ago with a small comment about a small issue specific to where I lived, but now the gap between the haves and have-nots has become a huge talking point. In some way it's become an allegory for the world, and as I saw in Berlin, it's be in, it became Brexit allegory. Now, oh, I should give some context here. This is AOD speaking. The, the, the interviewer has asked him for this next response. It's in, re it's in reply to him being asked films that were highly influential, the first films he fell in love with, formatively, you know. It's probably two films, actually. Stand By Me and Big Wednesday. Big Wednesday was a John Milius 1970s huge flop. I grew up on the coast of Cornwall and we were all madly into surfing and this is a film about Californian surfing in the, in the 60s and 70s and I never really noticed that it was about the 60s and 70s in California. I just watched it and thought it was about Cornwall. A mate of mine's older brother had an old VHS copy of it and we used to watch it. I fell in love with it, but probably because of the subject matter. In terms of a cinematic experience, that is Stand By Me, it was the poster that I fell in love with. It was on the wall in my local cinema where we used to go every Friday night. I think Stand By Me was a, was a 15, so I couldn't go and see it, but in the corridor that led down to screen 2 in the cinema, I used to walk past the poster of it, and I used to think, that film looks amazing. I was desperate to see it. When it came out on video, I used to get it out the video shop all the time, and it became a real regular for me and my friends. As I've got older, everyone from my generation, especially boys, as, as I, I suppose, it's quite, as it's quite a boy film, obviously, it's quite an important film. And now, then he's been asked about the film that he can watch any time, and that's Performance. I just see it more in it every, each time I see it. I think some people find the film quite problematic because it's so dense. The first time I saw it, I'd heard so much about it, and heard so much hype, and I watched it and thought, what the fuck was that? Now I could watch it any time. Now, moving on. 
living in that community, you hear the stories secondhand and you witness the stories. When you mix it all together, that is more dramatic than real life is ever going to be, and you then reduce it down to a condensed space of time. Everything that happened in that film is pretty much based on real life, an amalgam of different things I've heard and witnessed. For example, the scene with the guy who was on holiday who comes out in the morning and shouts at the fishermen that they shouldn't be making any noise at 8 o'clock, that's based on a real story. And in real life, the guy didn't even come out. He just yelled through the window. In terms of working in different ways to earn money, I think the characters sort of represent the situation that places like Coastal Cornwall are in, where you can rant and rave and say, you know what, newcomers are sending the prices of houses through the roof, and there's no place for locals to live. But on the other hand, I know plenty of people whose wages are paid by those people who do move down. All of their income comes from wealthy people moving in, so it's really not a black and white issue, and that's what I've tried to show with the brothers. They are polar opposites in terms of their point of view at times, but there is a lot of overlap. It becomes very hard to articulate one's frustration with it. Exactly. And what do you do with this helplessness? When you see this community having its guts torn out of it with nobody paying any attention to you, it's a place being rebranded as something else. Who is even looking at what gets lost? It's like the gentrification of London. At least in Cornwall, a lot of the time the local community and the fishing community end up living on housing estates, just out of the old village or up on the hill, which is what I've alluded to in Bait. The communities stay together, as if they don't care geographically where they live, even going a mile inland because that's where their friends and family are. They're together if slightly displaced. With Bait, it was about 20 years ago. I'd just moved down home to Cornwall, and the north coast of Cornwall used to always feature in the broadsheet newspapers in the summer tensions between rich holidaymakers or tourists and the locals in communities, which is something I'd always grown up with and been aware of, but taken as just the way things were. Reading it from somebody else's perspective, I started thinking that a lot of the journal this journalism is quite irresponsible because it actually stokes up more issues. Then as soon as September comes and all the schools go back, everybody gets back to their lives it's forgotten about. So I thought it'd be really great to make a film that documents that in a fictionalised sense that would be permanent. So I created a premise that was fictional, but something I could hang a lot of true stories off. As I operate the camera, I want to be close to the actors, and that means close-ups. I shoot everything on a 26mm lens, which is a good portrait lens on a movie camera. I don't want to have other crew members between me and the actors, I want to be the one that's cl up close and chatting to them as if I would be if I wasn't operating the camera. Also, I shoot academy ratio, which is perfect for faces when you're working with no budget. The things that you get for free, you've really got to exploit. I quite often cast based on what I see in people's eyes and people's faces, and then I want to show that on the screen. I think film language is quite limited. We've set ourselves a language without really exploring how far the form can be pushed. There's experimental film, obviously, but within narrative filmmaking, we've settled into this very vanilla style of telling stories, quite often based on photography or theatre. Photography can't do time-based montage, and theatre can't do the close-up. So combining the close-up of time-based montage is something that you'll notice is pre present a lot in a lot of bait. There's this thing called experimental film, but I still think we're at the stage where every film should be experimental. If you're not experimenting one way or another, then it's all over, really. For me, it's really important to follow my gut, and I know I'm not so different to everybody else that if it satisfies me, there will be an audience for it. There's a danger of second-guessing what people want. You can say that something is popular right now, but it takes a couple of years to make a film, by which time fashions and tastes will have changed. You're on a hiding to nothing. I know a lot of the industry is based around those hypothetical audiences, but that's when you produce films that are just okay, but will never really wow people. Well, Mark Jenkins, I have been very wowed by bait, and I endorse it here on AOD. Thanks again, everyone. I appreciate it very, very immensely. Thank you.